Is there anybody here who has a dream of writing a book and then you abandon the idea because you think you'll never get it published? Okay, I see a couple of hands. Ladies and gentlemen, I hope to convince all of you tonight that each of you is an author. Back in 2008, I had just completed a master's in ecology and I wanted to write a book about my thesis, which was the work that I was doing as a green school coordinator. And when I had the book written, I approached the publisher of a small publishing house with a view to getting it published. And he said to me, Anna, this is your first book. You're not famous yet. Your book doesn't have any sex, violence, or murder. <laughs> so there's a very slim chance of you getting it published. And I left feeling very dejected. I was very fortunate to find out a short time later that I could self-publish. I would pay for the publishing and it would be up to me to sell the books. And so I was successful. Green schools meeting the challenge of climate change. <laughs> Fast forward to the 1st of January 2016 and I started keeping a diary on my phone. I have voice activation on the phone and as I speak into the phone, it types it up. And by the end of the year, I had a book of a quarter of a million words, which was a commentary on Irish life throughout 2016. And I knew my chances of getting it published were quite slim. Didn't have any violence, didn't have any murder. And while I did have sex in 2016, <laughs> I didn't write about it. I googled to see how I could self-publish it and I discovered that I could publish it for free on Amazon's KDP platform, Kindle Direct Publishing. And I spent last summer teaching myself how to do that. And here it is. <laughs> Turned inside out by the spirit of 2016. I'm a teacher for the last 33 years teaching English, history and geography and when I returned to school in September I discovered that I was timetabled for transition year geography. And we always begin the year by looking at natural disasters and I wanted to keep it current. And after a week I discovered that the disasters I was looking at were all climate related. Now the wonderful thing about being a transition year teacher, you're free to devise your own syllabus and the students are free to be wonderful, creative, independent learners. So the students and myself decided that we would investigate climate change further and I would show them how to publish their work on KDP. And so we have teenagers facing climate change. Now, if I go back to my 2008 book, I had to sell the books myself. I placed copies of it in bookshops around the Midlands. And I have to confess, I didn't manage to sell a single copy. On the back page, I had written, we are the first generation who will decide whether or not the generation coming behind us is going to be able to live on planet Earth. And I finished by saying, future generations will never forgive us if we fail to take action on climate change. People picked up the book, read the cover, and put it back down. That was in 2008, and I had been working at that stage as a voluntary Green Schools coordinator. And to be honest, I was getting very little support. I don't really blame school management. They are dictated to by the Department of Education. And 
education for sustainable living is really not central to the department's education policy. In 2011, we had a whole school evaluation where a team of inspectors came in for a couple of days and I made myself available to them to speak to them about green schools and the work that I was doing trying to get the school to reduce its carbon footprint. But they didn't take me up on my offer. And you can read the report online. There isn't a single reference to education for sustainable living, green schools, or the efforts being made in the school to reduce its carbon emissions. You see, the Irish education system is deeply flawed. It's a system that engages the head and not the heart. It's a system where students are caught up in a race to get points and schools are in competition with each other to see how many students they can get to third level. But there's absolutely nothing being done to prepare the students for the world that they're going to be moving out into when they leave school. If we take junior search geography, for example, a new syllabus was introduced in 1992. And for 25 years, we've had junior cert geography exams. And I estimate that in those years, approximately one and a quarter million Irish students sat the junior cert geography exam. And every year, about 8% get an A. That's 100,000 students getting an A in geography. And for that exam, they have to know what causes climate change, what are its effects, and what can we do about it? But the way our education system is designed, the students learn the information, they go into the exam and regurgitate it. And when they come back out, everything that they have learned is forgotten. And the reason for that is because nothing has been done to engage the students at a heart level. Nothing has been done to teach them how to live in a sustainable way. Some of the students who have sat that geography exam in the last 25 years are now almost 40 years, and one of them is actually a government minister, Owen Murphy. If our education system was working, young people in Ireland in their 20s and 30s would be a huge voice calling for change, and we wouldn't have the situation now where the Irish government was described last week in the Irish Independent as the bad and ugly among EU nations. This was in response to a report that was written last week and published, which was um, published by the Climate Action Network, sponsored by the EU Commission. It places Ireland second from the bottom in the League of EU Countries, in taking action on climate change. But that doesn't really come as a surprise to me because in my 2016 book, I wrote about the drafting of the Paris Climate Change Agreement at the end of 2015 and it coming into force in November 2016. And the Irish government did everything it possibly could to wriggle its way out of getting Ireland to reduce its carbon emissions and they were successful. They got a derogation. But in spite of that derogation, a report published at the start of this month by the Environmental Protection Agency shows that Ireland, at best, will only be able to reduce its uh, carbon emissions by 5% of what they committed to do. And I believe that that is an appalling record. And the outcome of that come to, uh, 2020 will be that the government will be having a choice. Either they pay the very hefty fines that's going to be levied on them, or alternatively, they're going to have to buy carbon credits from countries that have exceeded their targets. Getting back to my transition year class, 
the two most memorable moments for me this year were last autumn. First of all, it was during the wildfires raging in California, and I gathered the students up close around me to the top of the class, and we watched a live news feed on my phone of a family that were returning to their burned out home in California. And there was a student the same age as the students in my class on her hands and knees, sifting through the ashes of what was once her bedroom to see if she could find her granny's wedding ring, which had been gifted to her. And I looked up and some of the students were crying in response to a student the same age as themselves facing this terrible tragedy. And a week later, I put a map up on the board which was drawn by Jason Simmons showing the British Isles in 2100. And it shows the Irish Midlands mostly underwater. And I looked down the class and there was a stunned silence. And there's always one lad in the class and sure enough, he put his hand up. Miss, that's a load of rubbish. <laughs> I said, OK, maybe you're right. Let's investigate it. And we did. And the weeks that followed, we learned that carbon dioxide levels in the atmosphere now stand at a ratio of 400 parts to 1 million parts. The last time that that happened was almost a million years ago, and that carbon dioxide levels in the atmosphere have been rising sharply since we started burning fossil fuels for energy. 19 of the hottest years on record have occurred in the last 20 years. 2017 was the hottest year on record globally. Scientists from NASA and the European Space Agency using data from satellite imagery tell us that one trillion, no, not one billion, one trillion tons of ice from the Antarctica ice sheets have entered the world's oceans in the last 25 years, causing sea levels to rise. Yes, indeed, if these trends continue unabated, low-lying areas of, of Ireland will be underwater in 2100. And then it struck me like a thunderbolt. I've been writing about climate change, reading about it, studying it, and I'd always seen it as something that was going to happen hundreds of years from now. But in that moment, in the class, that day, it dawned on me that some of the students sitting in the class are going to be alive in the last decade of this century. And the terrible tragedy of climate change is that those who have done the most to create the problem will suffer the least. And those who have done the least to create the problem will suffer the most. My children, my grandchildren, your children, your grandchildren, the children sitting in front of me in the class, they are the ones who are going to have to live through the adverse effects that climate change are going to bring. And the tragedy is that I am part of the generation that created this problem. In my 2016 book, I wrote about growing up on a small farm near Athboy in County Meath in the 1960s and 1970s. My mother shopped once a month. Nearly everything that we ate was produced at home and on the farm, bread, butter, milk, meat, eggs, cakes, buns, tarts, jam, eggs. There were no tins, no plastic, no refuse collection. 
the clothes that we wore were hand-me-downs. We didn't travel very far in those days, and we never went on holidays. And the thought of a foreign holiday was unimaginable. I am part of the generation that has created the problem. But it is our children who will have to live through it. In 2090, the children sitting in front of me today are not going to remember me for the number of points that they got in their leave insert. I believe that they will remember me as part of the generation that knew that climate change was happening because the signs were all around us. I wrote the introduction to this book the first week that we went back to school after the Christmas holidays last January. That very week, 13 people had died in mudslides in California that were brought on by torrential rain, which was aggravated by the fact that the slopes were stripped of their vegetation from the wildfires in the autumn. Thousands of people were flocking to the Niagara Falls because they had frozen solid. There was 15 inches of snow in parts of the Sahara Desert. And down in Sydney, in Australia, temperatures the previous Sunday had reached 117 degrees Fahrenheit, and the roads were melting in the heat. Back home, we had had an extended Christmas holiday because of Storm Eleanor, which brought wind speeds of 147 kilometres an hour to the country. And this came hot on the heels of Hurricane Ophelia that caused almost a billion euros worth of damage in October and resulted in the loss of three lives. Yes, indeed. The students in 2090 will know that we knew that climate change was happening. The evidence was there. We knew what was causing it. But the question is, what did we do about it? I'd like to read just the end of the prologue to this book that has been written by uh, Sally Coyne. And she says, climate change is no longer a myth. It is an imminent problem, one we can choose to ignore or embrace and take action. Climate change is our future. This book offers us an opportunity to make our voice heard. At the start of the talk, I said that I hope to convince all of you that you are an author. Our children's destiny is in our hands. Ladies and gentlemen, we are the authors of our children's future. Thank you very much.